Nazi Germany had been a feared and powerful force throughout World War II, but the splitting of the nucleus of a uranium atom by German scientists alerted U.S. attention in 1939. Splitting a heavy metal like the uranium atom was a discovery with incredible potential. The splitting of a nucleus, known as nuclear fission, is a controlled chain reaction that releases tremendous energy which can be used in explosive devices. This scientific discovery gave Germany the power to create a weapon with a force the world had never felt before. Could Germany create the world's first atomic bomb? The US and its allies could not allow that to happen. The race was on to be the first nation to create the atomic bomb. In 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt greenlit the Manhattan Project, the U.S. military mission to create the world's first atomic bomb. It was discovered that bombarding a uranium atom with neutrons could create a new element called plutonium. Plutonium is not found in nature, meaning it can only be produced in a controlled nuclear breeder core. Plutonium atoms were an alternative to uranium to fuel an atomic bomb because of its easily split nucleus. A site was requested to be constructed that produced plutonium to send to the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico for the assembly of nuclear weapons. The Hanford site in southeastern Washington was carefully selected by Colonel Franklin T. Mathias and his team. The expansive 586 square mile plot of desert land met nearly all of the criteria. With isolation and no major highways or railroads near, it was the perfect secluded spot to begin producing plutonium, one of the top secret components of an atomic bomb. It was a top secret because they were very paranoid about getting that methodology out. And they did not want the Germans and Japanese knowing that they were producing plutonium from bomb that was that could potentially destroy thousands of people in one go. Producing plutonium within a nuclear breeder generates large leftover quantities of chemical and radioactive waste. This waste varies in form as some is liquid while other waste product is contaminated items like used fuel rods. Waste is difficult to manage as it is thermally hot and corrosive, requiring special shielding and handling. During Hanford's production days, this waste was discarded into trenches and wooden crates. The higher hazard waste was pumped into 277 large underground tanks. The waste left on site from Hanford's production days are a deadly mix of various chemicals and radioactive materials. The site has an approximate 56 million gallons of high-level radioactive waste. They did that for a short amount of time, but they did not take care of the waste from these reactions very carefully. And they have waste all over the place, these big tanks. They dumped in the open ground. They have uh, trail trains that are still out there that are full of radioactive materials. And they really did not think about the future. They did not think about future generations. In that sense, I really have to blame the military. The military was just horrendous. By, and they continued as a goal of not giving people enough uh, safety, not considering the safety and sustainability of what they're doing. After nearly five decades of operation, the plutonium manufacturing era came to a halt in 1989 for Hanford. In this year, a tri-party agreement was established and the Hanford cleanup project began. The arrangement was between the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and Washington State. The cleanup development at Hanford is an expensive and challenging burden to this day. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, the remaining cost of cleanup will hit $107.7 billion by 2060. Uh, that's our money, our taxpayer money, that's driving this cleanup at the site. The cleanup process includes deactivation, decommissioning, and decontamination of buildings and facilities associated with the Hanford site. The hundreds of billions of gallons of harmful liquid waste must be drained and transported to other disposal facilities. Additionally, the millions of tons of solid waste must be removed. The radiation and hazard levels of waste vary, calling for different storage procedures. Low to intermediate levels of radioactive waste is typically stored in on-site facilities. Higher level waste recovered may be radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. This waste is shipped out securely to permanent waste disposal facilities. It is an ongoing threat to the region's environment, to our crops, to the water, the Columbia River, um, to people who live in the area. Um, the biggest threat in my mind is that uh, there, uh, there is a risk of fire or explosion that could release radionuclides and chemicals to the air. Um, and that could be bad, um, that could go into towns and cities or into the river, uh, and we know kind of what that looks like from Fukushima and Chernobyl, two big accidents. They had three instances in 2017 alone where plutonium particles 
left the site in the safe zone where they expected to have plutonium particles, but not to have it outside that. And so people outside did get exposed, their cars were exposed. Throughout the site's cleanup project, workers on site have reported exposure to chemical vapors while working near the waste tanks. Contact with any of the documented 1,800 chemicals that linger in the tanks can cause varying acute and long-term ailments, including nosebleeds, coughing, increased heart rate, general nausea, and more. In your opinion, does Hanford's contractors do an adequate job of keeping workers safe? They could do better. Um, there are certain instances where um, shortcuts were, were taken uh, by contractors that put workers in harm's, right, harm's way. So they were incentivized to hurry up, and in my view, they took shortcuts on workers. Uh, they were really concerned about doing it quickly, um, and it turns out they were paid bonuses to be able to get, get it done in a certain time, and if they started to go past their deadlines, then they would start losing significant portions of that. Reports indicate that some workers have developed neurological diseases, chronic obstructive disease, and cancers. Uh, some 42 workers now have plutonium that was inhaled into their bodies and we don't know what kind of health effect that might have for these people down the road. And you've got external and internal dosage of radiation. So external is, um, you know, just like you getting an x-ray in a hospital. And internal is you swallow a particle. And there's alpha emitters and beta emitters. The alpha emitters, you can actually hold them in a hand. You can hold them up the my hand, it would be a big deal because the skin would actually use enough of a barrier or shit paper to stop the alpha particle. But if you ingest a little bit of plutonium and inhale it, and that's been happening to workers recently over there that have been working on the tanks, they've inhaled plutonium, that plutonium gets in their lungs, and because the alpha particle emitter is right next to cells, they can damage the cells. Hanford does say it's one of the safest places to work in the United States and, and the reality is, is really there are much higher claims for worker injuries there. You know, there is a fund set up now by the government for injured workers. Um, there have been 5,000 workers compensated $1.3 billion um, at Hanford alone for workplace injuries. Workers who investigate problems on site, such as fraudulent activity or mismanagement, are referred to as whistleblowers. These individuals report site issues to the site's managers. Uh, so it's really important that people feel safe in reporting the, these problems so they can get corrected. And if you allow these workers to feel fear, um, they won't report these problems. So the, the worst thing then is for somebody not to report a safety issue or an environmental issue that because of fear of retaliation and losing their job, uh, and then that safety issue turns into a catastrophe. And I think a lot of people really do care about the environment and do want to clean things up, and they're actually making a huge sacrifice in a sense that they are, are working out there and they're protecting all of us, they're protecting people that are downwind, down river from the site. And they're making a huge contribution to society that I don't think we really appreciate enough what these people are doing. And part of it is they've been there in Hanford area in Richland a long time. They had their family there. And that's sort of a legacy job that goes on.